Saratoga is a proud name in the United States Navy, a name with a long career and deep ties to the Navy. The very first Saratoga served in the Continental Navy, named for a battle that was very much in recent memory. As such, her name is one of the very oldest and longest serving in USN history. Each of the Saratogas have their own story to tell. Each of them are quite fascinating and worthy of videos in their own rights. The first Saratoga of the Continental Navy. The second, battered and bruised, but defiant in the face of the British on the Great Lakes. The third, one of Commodore Perry's black ships from the opening of Japan. The fourth, CV-3, my favorite ship, and the first proper video on this channel. And finally, CV-60, the most recent of the bunch. There was also a brief period where there was an armored cruiser named Saratoga, though this was less a ship built to that name and more a case of renaming ships as naming schemes changed. It's a shame that the name has lapsed for so long because the Navy had to name carriers after politicians. One can hope one of the Fords revives such a historic name. This video, however, will focus on the first Saratoga, the sloop that had a short but exciting career, the originator of a long legacy. Unfortunately, there are no contemporary depictions of this ship that I am aware of. All the pictures in this video are going to be either conjecture or similar ships. I wish I could say better, but there just isn't anything to use that I've been able to find. Not surprising for such a small ship that had such a short service life. That aside, the first Saratoga was begun in December of 1779, just two years after the battle she was named for. Considering her auspicious name, and the 20th century ships that continued the name, she was actually a small and unassuming kind of ship. An 18-gun sloop that didn't displace much more than 150 tons at best. And she was certainly nothing impressive in terms of her size or firepower. The kind of warship that a bunch of revolting colonies could relatively easily build and use for commerce raiding and the like. Which does rather sum up the Continental Navy, really, aside from the relatively few, and short-lived, frigates they built. In any case, Saratoga was launched on April 10th of 1780, which is fairly late into the Revolutionary War, as these things go. At 94 feet long, with a beam of 29 feet, or is it 68 feet long and 25 feet in beam? Sources disagree on this. And the aforementioned displacement of around 150 tons, she was a fast and light kind of warship. Her guns further emphasize this, with her largest weapons being 16 nine-pounder guns, and two four-pounder guns to round it out and bring it to the full nine, to the full 18 guns. In comparison with the later ships designed by her builder, this is somewhat striking in how normally equipped she was for her type. After all, she was built by Warden and Humphreys. Yes, those of you who know your sailing Navy history, that Humphreys. The same Joshua Humphreys of the original Six Frigates fame. Does this make Saratoga something of a spiritual mother or aunt to those ships, Constitution included? Up to you to decide on that. Regardless, Saratoga's career began somewhat rough. Under Captain John Young, who would remain her commanding officer for her entire career, she was filled with issues on this voyage. As one might expect from an ill-funded and equipped navy, somewhere along the chain of construction and command, she was sent to sea on her first mission with insufficient ballast. On a ship as small as her in Atlantic waters, this made her dangerously unstable, at least under full canvas, which made her speed rather useless. This is unfortunate, as her first mission was to escort a ship, Mercury, carrying Henry Lawrence, the former president of the Continental Congress, to Europe. After giving up on waiting for further escorts from two Continental frigates, Saratoga would also be forced to give up her escort duties. Her instability kept her from keeping up with the swifter Mercury, and the constant need for Mercury to slow and wait for her ostensible escort eventually reached the point where Saratoga was sent back to get herself sorted out. Mercury would sail alone, and promptly get captured by the Royal Navy a few days later. Oof. Following this and a fortnight of training her gunnery, Saratoga would be more or less ship's shape. I say more or less because her ballast was still an issue, as we'll see. She was at least workable enough that, when sails were sighted on September 9th, Captain Young felt comfortable moving in on the sighting. Upon getting close enough to identify the ship as a British brig, 
Young did not hesitate at all to engage. Saratoga fired the first broadside in what would turn out to be a three-hour long engagement. The brig in question, HMS Capel, was a former American privateer that had been captured and put into service for the Royal Navy. She was lighter armed than Saratoga, which would ordinarily be an issue for the ship that has less guns, but gale force winds and heavy seas struck again. Saratoga still had issues with her ballast, and this prevented her from getting close enough, along with good handling on the British side, to board or hit the brig conclusively. As such, after the three hours of blasting away at one another, Young pulled Saratoga off. Not a ringing endorsement of her design or crew, perhaps, but she would soon prove herself a very fine ship. The first sign of that being, three days later, when she captured the British merchant Sarah. How ironic. Carrying assorted goods, primarily rum, from the West Indies. The merchantman surrendered without a fight, and would be brought to port and promptly sold off along with her cargo. A good thing, too, as the money would be put to use immediately on refitting the frigate Confederacy. Her second cruise would prove substantially more successful, after loading up on extra iron ballast to fix her stability issues anyway. Probably a good thing, because she would soon face a storm that did horrendous things to the British and came out with minimal fuss. As for the cruise itself, on the 25th, she re- captured an American brig, and sent her back to Philly with a prize crew. And then, on the 11th of October, she would capture two ships, including a 22-gun merchantman that almost certainly outgunned her. Though the other ship she captured was smaller and surrendered without a fight. The merchant was taken, after a broadside from Saratoga, when a boarding party led by Joshua Barney, who would, le- who would later reach the rank of Commodore and serve in the War of 1812, took her by force. The most exciting parts were yet to come, though, because upon learning of the fact that his new prizes were part of a merchant convoy scattered by a storm, Captain Young decided to run off and hunt the others down, which he did. Coming upon three sets of sails, what does Captain Young decide to do then? Why, sail his sloop down the middle of the British formation, blasting away at two of the ships at once. One broadside from his starboard guns took the brig Nancy out of the fight. The port guns heavily damaged the Elizabeth, with another broadside forcing her to strike her colors and surrender. The third ship ran away, but let's remember that Captain Young in Saratoga just took two ships in one go, after already capturing two ships themselves taken after capturing another ship. That brings him up to five prizes on this voyage so far, and he wasn't done yet, because on the way back home, Saratoga spotted two more sails, One quickly became apparent as a British 74-gun ship at the line, not the kind of ship you want to be anywhere near in a sloop. The other was yet another captured American brig, the Providence. In spite of the hulking form of the liner, Young promptly set off and after about an hour of chasing, recaptured the Providence. He quickly sent her and Saratoga off, evading the British capital ship and returning to port with a very successful second voyage under his belt. Between new captures and taking back American ships, he'd managed to take six prizes on that voyage. Come December 15th, after a period in refit, Saratoga set off on what would prove to be her last voyage, though none knew it at the time. She started by escorting a convoy of merchants, 12 in total, to Hispaniola to pick up French military supplies. In so doing, she would run down and engage another privateer, the Resolution, shortly after leaving port. After a single broadside, Saratoga captured the British ship and returned to her escort duties. Whereupon, on January 9th of 1781, Saratoga fought a running battle with the 20-gun Tonian? This ship had 9-pounders for all of her guns, and as a result, outgunned Saratoga. Captain Young continued to prove himself an able ship handler, however, and outmaneuvered and outfought his opponent. Taking relatively minor damage in return, he succeeded in capturing the larger ship, promptly taking her as a prize. His new prize would sail along with Saratoga, capturing yet another brig along the way, to Hispaniola. The prize money, particularly in regards to the wine taken aboard the brig, was quite a bonus. What was less of a bonus was, in attempting a salute for the French governor, one of Saratoga's guns burst and killed a sailor while maiming another. And some idiot loaded one of her other guns with grape shot, 
which managed to contrive to kill a woman minding her business on shore. Young managed, through fast talking and help from another American officer, to convince the governor that a British saboteur was responsible. The governor bought it, luckily for the Americans, though he probably wouldn't have raised too much of a stink over one unfortunate native woman. Saratoga, along with other American ships, would do a little mini-cruise, taking a couple further prizes while waiting for the convoy to prepare to leave. When that convoy did leave on March 15th, Saratoga would be among them. Only two, on March 18th, sight two unknown sails. Young, continuing his particularly aggressive streak, charged off after them. The seas were already rough enough that he had to seal his gun ports to keep water out, though. This didn't prevent him from overtaking one of the ships and taking her without a fight, and not waiting a moment after getting a prize crew aboard, immediately taking off after the other one. Unfortunately, both Saratoga and that other British ship would never be seen again. Nathaniel Penfield, a midshipman placed in charge of the prize crew, was probably the last man to see Saratoga. He watched through a spyglass as she vanished after the British ship into harsh wind and rain, heavy seas nearly capsizing the prize in its own right. John Young, one of the best captains in the Continental Navy, and Saratoga, one of the best ships, and at times one of the only ships in the Young Navy, had vanished without a trace. In spite of later British attempts to claim that Young and Saratoga had been taken down by HMS Iris, no one truly knows what happened. The simplest answer is probably that Saratoga and her prey were both lost to the storm that nearly sank the prize ship. Overtaken by rough weather, as so many other ships before and after. Regardless, it is a sad fate for such an illustrious ship and crew. The first Saratoga was, in the end, the shortest lived of the ships to bear her name. But she had a fine career in spite of a rocky start, and gave birth to a legacy that lasted for centuries. Not the worst fate for a mere sloop, eh? I would like to thank those of you who stick around for these videos. I know my longer form videos and general aversion to clickbait get me less views than, say, trying to do shorter format videos. The viewers who do watch the videos are ones I appreciate because of this. Thank you. I like my system, and I'm glad for the viewers who do as well. Remember to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.